In this video, we're reviewing pitching regulations under NFHS rules. Now this is gonna build off of defensive conferences, which was our last video, and you can find that linked in the video description. Our focus today will include important topics such as how many batters a pitcher must face and how many warm-up pitches a pitcher receives. By the end, we'll have covered every rule you need to know to enforce pitching regulations properly. After, we'll review the associated case plays from this week's quiz, and you can sign up to receive next week's quiz in the video description. Hey everyone, Patrick Farber here from GHSA Baseball Umpire Development and Umpire Classroom, where we help umpires to develop their knowledge and skills. If you're new here, please help us with our goal of reaching a thousand subscribers on YouTube. It's greatly appreciated. So let's jump into it. Pitching regulations come into effect as soon as the umpire in chief receives and accepts the official lineup cards at the plate meeting. Now, two quick reminders on this point. Rule 10-2-1 explains that the umpire in chief is always going to be the plate umpire. Second, the rule book terminology for a plate meeting is actually going to be a pregame conference. So since pitching regulations start to take effect at the plate meeting, we need to make sure we follow the proper procedures for a pregame conference. Remember, rule 1-1-2 covers what needs to be in the official lineup. And that requirement includes that the starting positions of all players must be included. Importantly for this, a starting pitcher must be listed. Now, the significance of having a starting pitcher listed shows up in rule 3-1-1. That rule says, after the lineup cards are official prior to the game, the player listed as pitcher shall pitch until the first opposing batter has been put out or has advanced to first base. Now, we'll circle back to the penalty if this doesn't occur, but know that generally a pitcher has to face at least one batter or record a third out of an inning. Now, there are two other regulations that apply to pitchers that we need to be aware of. For warm-up pitches, Rule 6-2-2C exception says, the starting pitchers may warm up by using not more than eight throws completed in one minute time from the first throw. When a pitcher is replaced during an inning or prior to an inning, the relief pitcher may not use more than eight throws completed in one minute time from the first throw. At the beginning of each subsequent inning, the pitcher may warm up by using not more than five throws completed in one minute time from the third out of the previous half inning. Now, there is an exception that says if a relief pitcher is entering either after an injury, ejection, or during or after inclement weather, then they may be granted additional warm-up pitches by the umpire in chief. Now, we probably aren't going to be too strict on the amount of time we give them to warm up, so long as they're not intentionally delaying the game or just showing absolutely no hustle. But we do need to be very strict on the number of warm-up pitches they receive. By letting your catcher know early that a new pitcher will receive eight pitches and a returning pitcher will receive five, you can help to speed up your game. Now, a good catcher should know this before you even talk to them about it, but it's important that at the sub varsity level, we're getting this habit into the players so that they continue to bring it up the levels. Now, let's jump over to the number of pitches a pitcher can throw. This is a rule that's set by each state, and for umpires, it's important to know that we have no jurisdiction over this. If during a game, you are approached by someone to argue that a pitcher is out of pitches yet still remains on the mound, you are simply to tell them that you have no jurisdiction over this rule. Their state association will have both a way for them to submit a complaint and will be the one that carries out any discipline for violation of this rule. Now let's talk about replacing the pitcher. We know the starting pitcher must throw to at least one batter until they either reach base or are put out. But what happens if they don't meet that requirement? If we continue reading down rule 3-1-1 in the penalty, it says, if the starting pitcher does not face one batter, he may play another position, but not return to pitch. Now let's talk about relief pitchers. Rule 3-1-2 says, if a pitcher is replaced while his team is on defense, the substitute pitcher shall pitch to the batter then at bat, or any substitute for that batter, until such batter is put out or reaches first base or until a third out has been made. Now, we want to ensure that this rule does not get violated by an action that would require the coach to have to pull their pitcher. The key example of this would be if a team has already used their three defensive conferences 
then we know that a fourth conference would require them to pull their pitcher. So we shouldn't allow that fourth defensive conference until the current new pitcher has faced at least one batter. Now, just like with the starters, there are the exceptions for the relief pitchers, including injury, ejection, or weather. And again, the penalty for them is just like it is for starters, and that that relief pitcher, having not faced one batter to completion, would not be allowed to return to pitch for the rest of the game. Now, there are two other rules to hit on here. The first is that a pitcher can only be removed from the mound and replaced back as pitcher once per inning. And of course, this is as long as they don't violate any of the other rules. The second is that if a replacement pitcher uses more pitches than allowed in rule 6-2-2, then the pitcher that was replaced cannot return back to the mound. An example would be if F1 strikes out the first batter and then is replaced by S1, who requires more than eight pitches to be ready to go, then F1 will not be allowed to return to pitch for the remainder of the game. Now, one thing we wanna make sure we don't mess up is knowing when someone actually becomes the pitcher. Obviously, we have announced substitutes where the coach tells you about the change, but what about when an unannounced substitution occurs? Unannounced substitutions are covered in rule 3-1-1. It says, in each of the following situations, the ball is declared live by the umpire in chief. Should there be no announcement of substitutions, a substitute has entered the game when the ball is live and a pitcher takes his place on the pitcher's plate. So what I want you to take away from this is that if a kid just goofing around between innings goes and engages the rubber or even throws a warm-up pitch, that doesn't make them the actual pitcher of record under high school rules. Only when the ball is made live and they engage the rubber is when an unannounced substitution can occur for the pitcher. So now that we've covered the basics of pitching regulations, let's go ahead and review the case plays for this week. Case play number one. Before the pregame conference, Team A's coach decides not to start F1. F1 had been published in the newspaper as today's starting pitcher. Is this legal? Is the answer yes? Or is the answer no, unless F1 is injured, ill, or ejected, or removed by his coach for disciplinary reasons, F1 shall pitch to the first batter? Or is the answer no, unless the coach is able to get the local newspaper to print a correction before the game, stating that the starting pitcher has changed. The correct answer here is yes, they can change the starting pitcher before we have the pregame conference. Remember, lineups and their included starting players only become official when they are received and accepted by the umpire in chief. Case play number two. After the pregame conference, Team A's coach decides not to start F1. F1 had been published in the newspaper as today's starting pitcher. Is this legal? Is the answer yes or is it no unless F1 is injured, ill, or ejected, or removed by his coach for disciplinary reasons? Or is the answer no unless the coach is able to get the local newspaper to print a correction before the game stating that the starting pitcher has changed? The answer to this one would be no because it is after the pregame conference where the umpire would have received the official lineup. Now, if F1 is ill, injured, or ejected, then the coach would be able to replace them. Otherwise, that pitcher has to face at least one batter. Next, question number three. In the top half of the first inning, the coach of the visiting team wants S1 to pinch hit for F1, hitting sixth in the lineup. F1 is listed on the lineup card as the starting pitcher. Is this legal? Is the answer no? F1 must remain in the game to pitch to the first batter in the bottom of the first inning? Or is it yes, a substitute may replace F1 while his team is at bat without penalty? The correct answer here is yes. A substitute may replace F1 while his team is at bat without penalty. Next, case play number four. In the top half of the first, S1 pinch hits for F1. In the bottom half of the first inning, F1 re-enters to face the first batter. Is this legal? Is the answer A, yes, he may re-enter and pitch. B, no, he may not re-enter. C, no, he may re-enter but cannot pitch. The correct answer here is yes, he may re-enter as the pitcher. Remember, a substitute can replace F1 while his team is at bat without penalty. Since F1 is listed as the starter, 
you shall re-enter and pitch to the first batter in the bottom of the first inning. Doing so will keep F1 in compliance with the rule. Next, case play number five. In the top half of the first, S1 pinch hits for F1. In the bottom half of the first inning, F1 does not re-enter. In the bottom of the third inning, the visiting team's head coach tries to bring F1 back into the game to pitch. Is this A, not allowed since F1 did not pitch to the first batter, F1 cannot re-enter the game? Is this B, this is not allowed since F1 did not pitch to the first batter, they may not return to pitch, however, they can re-enter to play a position other than pitcher? Or is it C, this is allowed since F1 was not in the game when his team went on defense in the bottom of the first, he has not been a pitcher yet and may come into the game to pitch. The correct answer is B. The reason being, since F1 did not return to the game to face the first batter, they are no longer allowed to pitch for the remainder of the game. However, they can still come into the game and play any other defensive position. Case play number six. Team A's starting pitcher is ambidextrous. How many warm-up throws does he receive? Is it A, eight per arm, B, eight total, can be used by either arm. C, four per arm, both sides must get the same amount, or D, six per arm. The correct answer here is B. A new pitcher will always get eight warm-up pitches, which can be split between both arms. Case play number seven, it is not an official's responsibility to determine if a team has violated a state association's pitching restriction policy. True or false? The correct answer here is true. As umpires, we have no jurisdiction over pitching regulations when it comes to the number of pitches a pitcher is allowed to throw. Case play number eight, S1 replaces F1. How much time or how many throws are permitted for his warmup? F1 is not injured and the weather is not inclement. The correct answer here would be eight pitches in one minute. It's a new pitcher coming onto the mound and there's none of the exceptions that would allow more time or more pitches. Case play number nine. F1, who was a base runner in his half of the first inning, is slow in coming out to take his warm-up pitches. The umpire refuses to permit him to warm up, stating he used up his one minute allotted time. The coach argues this is legal because the allotted time starts when the pitcher delivers his first warm-up pitch. Who is correct? Is it A, the umpire? The clock starts with the final out of the previous half inning? Or B, the coach, the clock starts when the pitcher delivers his first warm-up pitch? The correct answer is A, the umpire. The umpire is correct because the allotted time is supposed to start with the third out of the previous half inning. Case play number 10. Prior to the start of the third inning, starter F1 is replaced by a relief pitcher. How much time and or how many pitches does the relief pitcher get to warm up? Is the correct answer A, eight pitches or one minute from the final out of the previous half inning? B, five pitches or one minute from the final out of the previous half inning? C, eight pitches or one minute from the first warm up pitch? Or D, five pitches or one minute from the first warm up pitch? So this question from the case book isn't the best written but the correct answer that they give to it is going to be A. The new pitcher should receive eight pitches timed from the third out of the previous half inning. I think the most important thing for us here as umpires is that we always make sure we're counting the number of pitches and that they get no more than eight. Again, we don't need to be a stickler on the amount of time necessarily, so long as they aren't actively delaying the game or unnecessarily prolonging it. Case play number 11. F1 is replaced by S1. The catcher or coach of the defensive team indicates to the umpire in chief that his team wishes to grant an intentional base on balls. Following the intentional base on balls, the defensive team wants to replace S1 with S2. Is this legal? Is the answer yes, S1 has faced the necessary one batter, or no, S1 must face one batter? The correct answer here is yes. S1 does get credit for having faced a batter, with that batter being the one that was intentionally walked. Case play number 12. After throwing three warm-up pitches prior to the start of the fourth inning, F1 develops a blister on the tip of his index finger and is replaced as pitcher. F1's replacement takes the five remaining number of warm-up pitches due to starter F1. 
Can F1 return to pitch later in the game? The answer here is yes, so long as the substitute does not go over the eight warm-up pitches. This takes us to case play 13. After throwing three warm-up pitches prior to the start of the fourth inning, F1 develops a blister on the tip of his index finger and has replaced his pitcher. F1's replacement takes eight warm-up pitches. Can F1 return to pitch later in the game? The correct answer here is yes, F1 can return to pitch later in the game because the substitute did not use more than the eight allowed warm-up pitches in the rules. Case play 14. After throwing three warm-up pitches prior to the start of the fourth inning, F1 develops a blister on the tip of his index finger and has replaced his pitcher. F1's replacement takes 12 warm-up pitches. Can F1 return to pitch later in the game? For this one, the answer would be no because the replacement pitcher used more than the eight warm-up pitches granted in the rules. Finally, case play number 15. F1 intentionally throws at B4 and is ejected from the contest. How many warm-up throws does S1 receive? Is it A, no more than five, B, no more than eight, or C, eight or as many as necessary, similar to an injury or inclement weather? The correct answer here is C. Remember that any player that is ejected from the game allows a relief pitcher to take eight pitches or as many as necessary to get warmed up and ready to go. So there you have it, our review of pitching regulations under NFHS rules and how to enforce them in your games. If you found this video helpful, be sure to check out the rest of our videos and subscribe to our channel. And you can sign up to receive our weekly quizzes in the video description. So thanks again for watching. And as always, I look forward to seeing you on the field.